Welcome to Real Hollywood Land, where we delve into the stars and stories of old Hollywood. Before we get started, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you want more old Hollywood related videos. Okay, enough of that, let's dive in. Margarita Carmen Cancino was born October 17, 1918 in Brooklyn, New York, to two dancers, Eduardo Cancino and Volga Hayworth. Although she would gain worldwide fame as actress Rita Hayworth and appear in 61 films in her 37-year career, her life would be largely shaped by the men in her life. At best, these men saw her as a prize to capture, and at worst, as a meal ticket to make money for them with her talent and beauty. But with all of these controlling forces, where did that leave Margarita? The first man in Margarita's life was her father, and this relationship would shape the relationships that she would have with men for the rest of her life. As a vaudevillian performer while Margarita was a young girl, Eduardo came up with the idea of the Dancing Cancinos. This father-daughter dance act was essentially the family business. Although they were father and daughter due to Margarita's provocative dancing and clothing, people assumed that they were actually husband and wife. Eduardo did not bother to correct anyone when they made this assumption. Due to pesky child labor laws in America, Margarita was too young to work in nightclubs and bars in California where the family resided. So, her father took the act to Tijuana where the laws were a bit more fast and loose. He would often drunkenly gamble away the money they earned that night and force Margarita to go out and catch some fish for dinner. On the night that she failed to catch any fish for the pair to eat, he would often beat her. Naturally, he would only hit her in places where the costume would easily cover because he couldn't risk ruining the act. When they were in California, she often wasn't allowed to attend school because her father always forced her to practice their routine. She always complied because she really wanted to please him. When she wasn't practicing, she would often sit on the porch quietly, staring straight ahead while her brothers and the other neighborhood children played. Margarita herself never had the chance to be a child. According to what she would tell her second husband, Orson Welles, she and her father had an incestuous relationship. Her mother, not completely oblivious to what was going on, would travel with the pair from time to time and often sleep in Margarita's bed when she was home. However, that would be the extent of Volga's interventions. For the most part, Margarita was left to fend for herself. Since she was always working and rehearsing, Margarita didn't finish high school, but did start getting small parts in movies. These small parts were enough to get her a six-month contract at Fox. At this point, her name was shortened from Margarita to Rita Cancino. She continued to play in small roles, usually as an exotic foreigner due to her dark hair and gypsy-like looks. However, by the end of her six-month contract, Fox had merged with 20th Century, and her contract wasn't renewed. Around this time, she met self-proclaimed oil man and wannabe producer Edward Judson. He wasn't actually an oil man or a producer, he was just a grifter looking for a mark. See, in pre-Google days, you could pretty much say you were anything and it was pretty hard to verify, so it worked out. Anyway. In Rita, he found the perfect mark, a young starlet, primed for a Hollywood career. He convinced her that with his help, she would get a contract and become a star. In 1937, at age 18, she married Edward, who was the same age as her father. Since he didn't have anything else, she was his business. He became her manager and helped her get a contract at Columbia. It was his idea to update her look to make her look more marketable. Her hairline was very low, so we had her get electrolysis to push her hairline back and lightened up her hair. However, his other methods were much less orthodox. He also encouraged her to sleep with studio heads to get herself a contract, including Harry Cohen from Columbia. Although she refused and was still able to get the contract at Columbia, Harry Cohen never respected her. He even went out of his way to disrespect her for the rest of her time at Columbia. As far as Edward was concerned, it was just about doing business, and she was his full-time business. Once she was signed to Columbia, he didn't work but found plenty of ways to spend her money. Rita would later say, quote, He helped me with my career and helped himself to my money, end quote. Once she realized what kind of man he truly was, she tried to leave him on more than one occasion, which would often be met with threats of physical violence and stalking. He often threatened to throw acid on her face so he would ruin her livelihood if she ever left him. By the time they divorced in 1942, she was left with nothing and had to eat meals at her friends' homes because she didn't have any money, since Edward had spent it all. But at least the marriage was over, and she was free from him. Although she was free from Edward, Harry Cohn, the Columbia studio head, would remain a constant influence in her life for years to come. He thought that her name sounded too Spanish and that her look was still too Mediterranean. Edward had the hair changed, but 
Perry thought her name needed to be changed as well, so she adopted her mother's maiden name, Hayward, to sound, well, less Spanish. Now she was truly ready to become a star. With all of these changes, she kept super busy. In 1937 alone, she was in five Columbia Pictures and three independent movies. With pressure from Harry Cohn, directors started using her in larger roles, including Only Angels Have Wings, which starred Cary Grant and Jean Arthur. Her star continued to rise, and she starred opposite Fred Astaire in 1941's You'll Never Get Rich, which was one of the highest budgeted movies that Columbia had ever made. Astaire would later say that she was his favorite dance partner. I wonder how Ginger felt about that. However, life at the studio wasn't easy. Even though Rita was known for being agreeable and easy to work with, she would later say that Columbia owned her. Even after he died, Rita said that Harry Cohn was a monster. She was his biggest moneymaker, and Harry saw her as his property. Her next marriage would be very different from her first. While traveling in South America, actor-director Orson Welles saw a pinup picture of Rita from Life magazine and became determined to make her his second wife. When he came back to Hollywood, he did just that. After pursuing Rita, he won her over, and on September 7, 1943, Rita married Orson Welles on her lunch break from the studio. Like her previous husband, Orson was like a father figure to Rita, even though he was much closer to her in age. But unlike her actual father and her first husband, he was protective of her and not exploitative. Orson was different. He had dreams beyond Hollywood and had political aspirations. This drew Rita towards him because she too wanted to leave Hollywood at this point. However, his dreams were not for the quiet family life that Rita very much wanted. Rita would become pregnant with their daughter Rebecca and give birth on December 17, 1944. Unfortunately, Orson had little interest in becoming or being a father. It just wasn't something that he was interested in. For Orson, his career came first. As her marriage progressed, Rita's insecurities, most likely caused by her traumatic childhood, became more apparent to Orson and it was something that he was just not equipped to handle. He loved her, but spent more and more time outside of the home and began having affairs with other women, including Judy Garland at one point. He even frequented prostitutes while Rita was at home with baby Rebecca. When he wasn't at the studio or with other women, Orson spent his time on the road giving political speeches. Orson's constant absence would cause Rita to fly into rages and begin drinking heavily. Her drinking became dangerous and she would get in the car and drive through the Hollywood Hills when she was angry. Due to her instability, Orson ultimately thought that she would be a liability to his budding political career. During this time, she would make what would be her signature movie, Gilda, opposite Glenn Ford in 1947. She and Glenn would remain friends for the rest of her life. This would be the image that most people associate with Rita. Even now, in real life, she was nothing like Gilda at all. She would later say, quote, Men go to bed with Gilda, but wake up with me, end quote. When she had enough of Orson's neglect, Rita filed for a divorce. Orson knew that he wasn't as good to his wife and daughter as he could have been. She would later say that her years with Orson were her happiest. To that, Orson's response was, quote, if this was happiness, imagine what the rest of her life must have been, end quote. Rita and Orson would later briefly reconcile and make the movie The Lady from Shanghai together in 1947. In this film, much to Harry Cohn's dismay, Rita cut her hair short and dyed it blonde. Harry felt as though Rita, including her hair, were assets of the studio. Even though her relationship with Orson would be over, she was still the property of Harry and Columbia Studios. Rita's statement about Gilda became all too true when it was seen that her next husband fell in love with the image of Gilda and not the real Rita. Rita was introduced to Prince Ali Khan while traveling in Cannes, France in 1948. They had a whirlwind, year-long courtship, and Rita was two months pregnant with their daughter, Princess Yasmin Aga Khan, when they married May 27, 1949. So before Grace Kelly and way before Meghan Markle, Rita was the first American actress to become a princess. He wasn't the prince of a specific geographic territory, but of a large Muslim sect, and said to have been a direct descendant of Muhammad himself. Nonetheless, he was rich and well-connected. She would break her contract with Columbia and basically run away to Europe to be with her prince. Their marriage wasn't easy for Rita. Beyond their differences in religion, he was obviously Muslim and she was raised Roman Catholic. They had differences in desired lifestyles as well. Rita had wanted to escape Hollywood, to be with Ali, and to have a family life. But he wanted the opposite. Ali was definitely a playboy and did not stop his playboy ways when he was married to Rita. Additionally, in his chateau in the south of France, Ali would often have guests and lavish parties and wanted Rita to be the constant hostess. 
a role she never desired to play. Rita instead wanted a quiet home life with her children and Prince, and that's not what happened at all. Soon she would take her daughters, Yasmin and Rebecca, back to the States and go back to acting. Although the prince had significant access to money and led a lavish lifestyle, he also had no problem spending her money as well. When she came back to America, she didn't have much money left and had to borrow from a friend to have a place to stay until she began to work again. Harry Cohn took her back to Columbia, but knew that she needed the money and that he could exploit that fact. Although she had script approval in her previous contract, she had broken that contract by running off with Ellie. So now she had to appear in whatever movie he decided. This time, she wasn't as agreeable as she had been in the past. She clashed with Harry and ended up being suspended while filming her first movie back, Affair in Trinidad. She continued to make movies, and Rita did not stay single for long. Her next marriage was just around the corner. By the time Rita met singer Dick Hames, his career was on the downslide. He owed money to his two ex-wives for child support, as well as a significant amount to the IRS. He had spent most of his money that he had earned as a musician and saw Rita as the perfect way to fix this problem. He was able to win her over by having her feel that they were both victims of their former spouses and that it was just the two of them against the world. It worked because, well, in the end, Rita would end up marrying him and paying most of his debts. When he started dating Rita, his problems continued to mount. He was an Argentinian citizen and once he started dating Rita, ran into trouble with immigration. He thought that Harry Cohn was behind this to keep him away from Columbia's top property, and there's probably something to that. His natural solution was to convince Rita to marry him so he could become a legal citizen. He guilt-tripped her and told her that all of his problems were actually her fault. Always wanting to help the man in her life, Rita obliged. Dick knew that not only would marriage to her help with immigration, it would also help his career. It did not go without notice that when she would come to his shows or it was rumored that she would be there, they would sell out. Otherwise, no one was really interested in seeing Dick Hames perform. The two had a lavish wedding in the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas in 1953. The wedding guests consisted of more press and onlookers than actual guests. Part of the very troubling part about this public wedding was that during this time, Rita received credible kidnapping threats against Princess Jasmine to the point where the FBI was involved. Oddly, she felt it was more important to help Dick with his comeback and allowed Yasmin and Rebecca to both be photographed during their wedding and during occasions to help with his publicity. Recent photographs are the last thing you should do when trying to deter kidnappers. While she was on the road traveling with Dick for his singing engagements, she left the girls with caretaker Dorothy Chambers in New York. Unfortunately, she did not fit out the situation very well and the girls were living in squalor to the point of government intervention and Rita almost losing custody of her children. Not only were the girls living in less than ideal conditions, but Rebecca wasn't in school as she should have been. This caused both Ali and Orson to intervene for the safety of their daughters. In the end, Rita was able to keep the custody of her girls after they were placed in protective care for a bit, but the public spectacle itself was an embarrassment. Dick, like Rita's previous husbands, had no problem spending Rita's money. However, as Rita was making fewer movies and Dick wasn't making much of anything, the money was starting to run out. Dick thought it would be best to help Rita negotiate a new contract. She owned shares of a production company and he convinced her that it would be best for her to sell them so they'd have an instant cash infusion of $700,000. When negotiating the new contract, all the provisions were for Dick's benefit. He wanted full access to the studio, a loan to help pay his debts, help with his immigration troubles, as well as other demands. The new contract committed her to two more movies at Columbia. Dick was eager to have her make these films and then get out of the contract so he would have even more control over her career. The control Dick had over her extended to beyond just her career. He convinced her that she shouldn't let Ali see his daughter, Princess Yasmin, even though he desperately wanted to spend time with her and for Yasmin to spend time with her aging grandfather. Something drastic had to happen to free Rita of Dick's control. One night at the Coconut Grove nightclub, Dick struck her and gave her a black eye while horrified patrons looked on. This, along with Dick's threat of deportation being lifted and Rita's guilt eliminated, was enough for Rita to finally realize that it was time to leave him, and she did. During much of her time with Dick and Ali, she wasn't making movies. Her second to last film with Columbia, Fire Down Below, was her first picture in four years, and the time away was evident. The crew was careful with lighting to make her look like her old self. Years of stress and drinking had began to take their toll on Rita's looks. When filming her last picture with Columbia, pal Joey, she heard a fan say, Oh, she looks so old. 
She tried not to let it bother her, but of course it did. She wasn't even 40 years old. Pal Joey finished her obligations to Columbia. In 1957, she left Dick and Columbia for good. She was free from both Dick and Harry, however, she wouldn't be free for that long. Shortly after leaving Columbia, she was introduced by a longtime friend to independent producer James Hill. The two would marry February 2, 1958, and they soon bought a home together, and Rita wanted to be done with Hollywood for good at this point. However, she would soon need to go back to work to help pay for the house. Of course, he thought that Rita would be perfect for his movies. He would cast her in Separate Tables, a movie that would earn her the Harbor Lampoon's Worst Actress Award in 1958. The two would divorce in 1961. During their marriage, she would start to show the signs that would later be recognized as early onset Alzheimer's disease. However, at the time, people thought her forgetful nature and often erratic behavior was due to alcoholism. Rita had mood swings and outbursts since her 20s, but they started to become more violent and more severe, and she would even throw things at people. Now in her 40s, she would have outbursts and then go back as if nothing had happened at all, and she would not remember any of it. Alcohol only made the problem worse. When someone is suffering from signs of early Alzheimer's disease, small quantities of alcohol can have disastrous effects. It wasn't long before her condition impacted her acting ability. She had been set to appear in a few stage performances but had to pull out early because she simply couldn't remember her lines. She admitted memory trouble to good friend actor Ann Miller, who tried to help, but Rita refused to go to a doctor and to seek help for what was actually going on with her. Her last completed movie was The Wrath of God in 1972. She had so much trouble with her lines that they had to film her scenes line by line. She was only 53 when filming this movie. She started showing more troubling signs related to memory issues. On one occasion, she invited friends Ann Miller and her maid's pen over for dinner. When they arrived, she came to the door with a butcher knife and started screaming that she wasn't signing autographs and chased them away with the knife. The next day, she called Anne to ask why they hadn't come for dinner. On an unfortunate TWA flight in 1976, she became belligerent, was a flight attendant, and disoriented. The next day, she had no recollection and acted as though nothing had happened at all. She would not be diagnosed with Alzheimer's until several years later, in 1980. At the time of her diagnosis, Princess Jasmine took over the care of her mother who needed constant care at that point. Yasmin and Rita had adjoining apartments in the San Remo in New York overlooking Central Park and Yasmin would have someone come in and do her mother's hair and makeup regularly so that she would still feel pretty. Rita would die at age 68 in 1987. Sadly, her entire life seemed to be spent trying to satisfy the desires of one man or another, even if those desires were not in her best interest. Margarita deserved so much better than what she got. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to subscribe to this channel and like this video. I'll see you next time.